Thank you. Thank you for that um, lovely introduction. Um, so, okay, so we, we're called the Mural Arts Program, but this is really, um, I think what we do is community-based public art. And what we really want is to inspire people to think about muralism in the 21st century and all that means. And we want you to think about the phrase that's being used um, uh, by activists and academics and museum people called social practice. And I think that's what we do. It's a form of social practice because we're talking about the art, but really what concerns us tremendously, it's all the things that go on that lead up to the art. So that I want you to think about our work as sort of a narrative arc that starts when we begin to think about a project and goes through all our programs and the projects. And then even when the work is completed, it has a life of its own where we hope it continues to inspire people. So we're really excited. We think we're completely on a mission. And even though we've been doing this work for a long, long time, um, I feel that now more than ever, we're embracing innovation and creativity and going 100 miles an hour to use art on behalf of all the citizens in the city of Philadelphia. And I'm someone who believes deeply and passionately about um, issues related to equity and justice and feel that there is this brilliant nexus between art and social change. Oh, sorry, that was me just leaning on something. Um, so what you're gonna see today is you're gonna see um, examples of our projects. I'm gonna talk about our programs. And then as I talk, please feel free to ask questions as I go. And then I'm gonna leave plenty of time for questions at the end. So, okay. So Philly, 1984. So quickly, my background was I went to Stanford. I was a double major fine art and political science. I was an artist who thought about law school. I had the good fortune of moving to LA. I saw these extraordinary murals down there. I became really inspired and thought maybe I could do a mural. Um, so I applied to the LA mural program. They told me I was past the deadline. I, I you know, my application, I should come back in a year. I just drove them crazy. I'm a total pest. And so that's how we've made it through four mayors. I just beat them down. <laughs> I just wear people out. Um, anyway, so um, eventually I got this commission doing a mural in, in Santa Monica. And it was like so extraordinary because like I'm someone who thought, oh, murals are important because they make art accessible to everyone. Like I believed it then, I believe it now. But standing on this corner at Ocean Park in Maine painting my first mural, it was thrilling. And I was talking to people about neighborhood issues and politics. and. It was so exciting. And then I started working with kids on probation, and then I became really sick. I have lupus, and I grew up in Margate, New Jersey, so I came back east to be with my family. And as I started to get better, I thought, oh, I don't want to move back to LA. I want to stay in this area. And I thought, well, maybe I'll go to law school, because that's what it's, you know, it seemed like, okay, so now I'll go to law school. But then one day I read in the Philadelphia Inquirer about this program called the Anti Graffiti Network. And our former mayor, Wilson Good, was very exciting. He's the first African-American mayor. And he said, I'm going to start this anti-graffiti network in response to the graffiti crisis in Philadelphia. And it comes to my attention that a lot of the young people really love art. And I'm going to have an art component. I was like, oh, that could be me. <laughs> so I sent my resume to the mayor's office. And I thought, OK, I'll call every day if I have to. And then, what? but I didn't have to because I got a call from the man who was the head of arts and culture. And so I was like, oh my God, I can't believe it. So I called this guy back and he says, come up to Philadelphia for an interview. I know your work in Los Angeles. I was like, yikes. So I go up to Philly, I'm so excited. I meet Oliver Franklin. He sends me to Tim Spencer. And Tim Spencer is, he's the guy in the suit jacket, but not the guy at the podium. He is the new executive director of, of the Anti-Graffiti Network. So I go meet Tim and Tim looks at my resume and it's like a five minute conversation. He goes, okay, you're hired. You're going to have about a thousand kids. They're all graffiti writers. Like, good luck. Essentially, that was it. It was like so short. So he goes, oh, wait a minute. One more thing. It goes under his desk and he gives me a box. And in the box, there are magic markers and paper. And I was like, oh my God, is this it? And it was like, I walked out in the main office, which was about the size of this space. And there were community organizers, because there were like 12 community organizers at anti graffiti. And it was like chaos, because there were police officers and judges calling and detectives. and all these kids, like a million kids with backpacks that made clicking sounds, and people would say, what's in your backpack? And they would say, books. And you, you, then they'd go in the hall, and they'd be here, and I'd be, oh my god, they're like writing on the walls of City Hall Annex. This is awful. But like, I'm someone who's, oh, who always like reading crime novels, right? So I'm like, I'm living on the edge. <laughs> I thought, well, I'll try this for a few months, and then I'll go to law school. <laughs> that is my out. So. Um, I was like, oh my, what do I do? So I'm here I am, I'm hired. I was hired at $12,000 a year, 
My title was field representative because I didn't know what to do with an artist. I didn't have a desk, so I was on the move. <laughs> and the city gave me an old undercover police car that was totally dented, and when you beeped the horn, the trunk flew open. It was very mysterious, but it was like my lemon. I loved it. And um, I drove around Philly and saw these like graffiti pieces. I took tags, but then I saw some really interesting graffiti pieces, and I thought, well, Wilson Good was right. Some of these kids have talent. So I want to pause here about anti-graffiti for a minute. So there are a couple points I want to make. Number one, um, Wilson Good had a lot of courage because he was taking on what was really a social epidemic. And he put money on the table to intervene in what was clearly a citywide crisis. Elected officials can talk all they want about problems. If they're not going to make a commitment and put funding on the table, it becomes a moot point. And he was brave and he stood up to people who said, what a waste of taxpayers' money. Why don't you just send graffiti writers to jail? Well, that wasn't very practical. And why don't you just paint it out? Well, cities all over America were painting it out. And guess what? The graffiti was coming back the next day. So that wasn't really working either. So he was committed to thinking out of the box and said, I'm going to work with the kids who are writing on walls. And we're going to develop our programs. And we're going to get them to help us clean up Philadelphia. And it was a visionary program. And I don't use that word lightly. I say visionary because the seat of power was open to kids from the poorest neighborhoods of the city, period. So this was about access. And to me, that was thrilling and exciting. I had no idea what I was doing. There was no roadmap or blueprint. This was a new program. So I thought to myself, so what am I going to do? Well, there was a system in place. You see how happy everybody looks here? They're all signing a pledge where they swear they will never write on walls for the rest of their lives. They're all going like this. And so and in exchange, they had to do scrub time, and then they were sent to me. So I very quickly had to figure out what to do, what to do, what to do. So I said, okay, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to start run, uh, offering programs. I called up the recreation department and said, I want to offer classes for former graffiti writers. I emphasize former. I called the Philadelphia Museum of Art. And then my boss gave me an assistant, this young man who wrote Tran everywhere. He was notorious. I'm like, really? He's like my assistant? I thought my assistant would come from, I don't know, Penn or <laughs> University of the Arts or a school like that. <laughs> so I'm like, yikes, this guy is my assistant. OK, great. So then I'm talking to Tran, and I said, look, I want to build a program that will reach kids. I, I, you know, I don't want to do anything punitive, so what should I do? So he said, well, you have to understand why kids write on walls. I said, please, illuminate me. Why? And he goes, well, they're trying to build a reputation. Many of them are frustrated artists. They're highly organized. There are graffiti gangs. They meet at 12th and Cecil B. Moore in an empty building on Saturdays. They plan their routes, their leaders, their followers. It was way more organized than I would have ever imagined. So I said, OK, so I would like to infiltrate and meet the leaders. Because if we could meet the leaders and lure them in through art, <laughs> that was my carrot, uh, we will get all the followers. And my carrot was actually significant because Wilson Good put money on the table so I could hire kids. Not immediately, they had to pay their dues, but over a period of time they could work and stay employed for months and ultimately years. So I'm like, okay, we're going to do this. So um, one night on a Friday night, this was not my plan. There was a knock on my door and I opened the door and there is Tran, the assistant, with 10 very tall young men. Tran knew where I lived because I used to stop there for art supplies at my house because the city gave me terrible equipment. They gave me beige paint, big brushes. There was no way to do art. So I'm like stunned because they introduced themselves to me as baby rock and knife and cat and cool earl. So I'm like, yeah, I don't know if I should call the police or invite them in. So I said, I don't know why I said this. I said, come in, we'll chat and have some tea. I don't know why I said that. I'm sure I was like the most uncool person they ever met. So they come in and they get really excited. They look at my bookshelf that's filled with art books. And I start passing out art books. And one young man, he stood up and he said, well, his name was Knife, which made my spine stiffen. And I, he said that he had some questions for me, that he heard I had done murals in LA. He was clearly the spokesperson for the group. So I said, oh, yes, Knife. <laughs> and it was Mr. Knife, right? So I said, what's on your mind? So he said, well, I want to know what you think about the color fields of Mark Rothko's paintings. And I love William de Kooning and, my, and Hans Hoffman. And my all-time favorite is Andy Warhol. Now, now, these guys all told me they dropped out of school in 11th grade, which was true. So I was curious. I said, how in the world do you know about the abstract expressionists? Really, they weren't mentioning like Norman Rockwell, right? This, these were not household names. So Knife goes into his backpack, and he pulls out the magazine Art in America. And he goes, well, I've been stealing this since I was 10. So I said, well, that's highly unusual to steal art in America. <laughs> I never would have put that, I never would have guessed. 
So, and I, and I, I said, but that's interesting. And they were all okay, Carol, we love Mark Rothko. I said, that's great, you like Mark Rothko. I said, all of you, please open up your black books. And I saw in those books amazing drawings. They were self-taught. They've been drawing from comic books since they were young. So I thought to myself, wow, now, like, I'm somebody who's had great privilege in my life. Like, I had, like, a mom who was a wonderful artist, a dad who was a businessman who loved art. I went to museums when I was young. I went to Stanford. I went to grad school. It was never mysterious for me to study art. But for these kids who dropped out of high school, or even if they'd stayed in high school, art was something that was elusive. Yet, they had raw talent, and they had knowledge. And I realized this is our common ground. We are so different. And yet, we have a mutual love of art. And I thought, think about it, Jane Golden. Think about it. They, like, they don't mind heights. They work in the weather. And they're great wall hunters. They could be fantastic mural painters. So I, thought, I went upstairs. I brought down books of murals in LA, Chicago, and San Francisco. I said, look through these books, because this is what we're going to do in Philly. We're going to build a mural program. And guess what? You guys are going to work with me. And they were like, no way. We want to work with spray paint. And I said, well, guess what? You can at the Anti-Graffiti Network. So they said, well, then we, we're not going to sign up. I said, well, then what are you going to do? Where are you going to be when you're 25? And they said, well, we're going to be famous. We're going to be like Keith Haring. I said, really? I said, so here's a wake-up call. Only a handful of artists will make it in America who can rely solely on their art. So I'm going to ask the question again. Your high school dropouts, where are you going to be when you're 25? And they said, well, quite honestly, we think we'll be dead or at greater from prison. So I said, so now we're making some progress, and you're being honest in why you should sign the pledge and come and be part of this program. I said, because guess what? You like Mark Rothko? We'll go to the Museum of Modern Art. I said, you like art? We're going to go to the Philadelphia Museum of Art, and you are going to paint murals. You're going to help me, and you're going to do something artists all over America would love to do. You're going to get paid to paint after a period of time, and you can make a difference in the civic life of the city of Philadelphia. You guys can do that. You don't have to be outlaws forever, right? And so they were like, mm, well, maybe we'll, maybe we'll sign up. I said, that's great. You should. So um, they left. We shook hands. And on my way to work the next day, I'm like, yes, this was a victory. I see these new graffiti tags. Except there's one addition. They wrote Cool Jane up and down Broad Street. So I'm like, OK, this is totally not funny, and I'm going to lose my job. <laughs> And I've never thought of myself as cool anyway. <laughs> so I get to City Hall, and I see Tran, the assistant. And I said, Tran, this is just so bad. He goes, well, you're like the first adult who ever talked to them. I said, yeah, well, here's lesson one. They should have just said thanks. <laughs> this is really unnecessary. So we had an emergency session. We clean, I got them all together. We cleaned South Broad Street. The next week, we had a class at the art museum. And we started going into high gear. And I said, we are going to build up a mural program in the city of Philadelphia, and you guys are going to help. And they did. And you know what? We drove around Philadelphia, and we asked people if they wanted art. And you know what people said in the early days? We're not interested in art. We're interested in housing, and we're interested in jobs. This is a poor neighborhood. What can art do? And we would say, well, what would you like here? And people would pause and say, well, wait a minute. No one ever asks us what we want. Things are either not done or they're done to us. And the only visual stimulation we have are billboards advertising alcohol and tobacco. And Miss Rachel Bagby, who was the first block captain I worked with, she looked at me and she said, you know what? Our kids are not going to have beauty because no one is going to the Philadelphia Museum of Art. And we're not going around Kelly Drive to see the sculptures. Art is something, it's like foreign. But I said, so what do you want? And she said, okay, I'm hearing you. What we want is that we went to Africa. We went to Mount Kilimanjaro. And it was so inspiring. We wanted a 20th and Diamond on that wall. So we were like, check, done. And so we did Mount Kilimanjaro. And then people looked at the lot and they said, wait a minute, this is disgraceful. We don't really, we, 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 won't, we don't have to take this. And we were like, you're right, you don't have to take it. So we brought in Philadelphia Green and we started organizing cleanups. And then we designed a resource guide to demystify city services. Why shouldn't people in struggling neighborhoods have change? Of course they should. And so we found ourselves in the strange position of being on the front lines of social change. Like if you had met me in 84 and said, Jane, what do you think murals can do? I'd say they can beautify, they can inspire. But I wouldn't have said they're change agents, right? But that's what I saw with my own eyes. I saw the murals become a beacon and a focal point and a sign that people care, and more importantly, that things could change. And when that started to happen, I realized, wait a minute. We are seeing some success here. This is not when we become complacent and go, yay, us, right? No one's writing on the wall. Isn't that great? Kids are working on it. No. 
there's got to be a greater strategy at work here to try to use the art to do other things in the neighborhood. The art should be a broker for other things. So we saw people go from being on the sidelines feeling disempowered, disenfranchised, like I'm tired of moving the rock up the mountain and nothing happening in this community. Suddenly people said, wait a minute. We're engaged and we're seeing something happen, something move. And that was power. And so we were able to grab onto it and we started doing murals in other places and working like this with a famous artist, Kent Twitchell, who was from Los Angeles. Now Kent is someone who was at that, this time, 1989, was one of the top five muralists in the country. He was getting $50,000 a mural in Los Angeles. We had a $2,000 grant from the Arts Council. So I called him up, I said, well, we'd like you to come to Philly. Bad news, I have $2,000. He said, well, I'll come to Philly if I could do Dr. J in a suit. I'm like, Dr. J in a suit, that's so interesting. Why? He goes, because I want kids to think beyond sports. So we tracked down Dr. J, he was shooting a TV commercial, his agent gave me two minutes. I run in like at the speed of light. I'm like, Dr. J, my name's Jane Golden. I work with kids, I work, he's like, slow down. <laughs> he said, whatever you're asking, it's yes. <laughs> I think he just wanted to. Thank you, thank you for that um, lovely introduction. Um, so, okay, so we, we're called the Mural Arts Program. But this is really, um, I think what we do is community-based public art. And what we really want is to inspire people to think about muralism in the 21st century and all that means. And we want you to think about the phrase that's being used um, uh, by activists and academics and museum people called social practice. And I think that's what we do. It's a form of social practice because we're talking about the art but really what concerns us tremendously, it's all the things that go on that lead up to the art. So that I want you to think about our work as sort of a narrative arc that starts when we begin to think about a project and goes through all our programs and the projects. And then even when the work is completed, it has a life of its own where we hope it continues to inspire people. So we're really excited. We think we're completely on a mission. And even though we've been doing this work for a long, long time, um, I feel that now more than ever we're embracing innovation and creativity and going 100 miles an hour to use art on behalf of all the citizens in the city of Philadelphia. And I'm someone who believes deeply and passionately about um, issues related to equity and justice and feel that there is this brilliant nexus between art and social change. Oh, sorry, that was me just leaning on something. Um, so what you're going to see today is you're going to see um, Examples of our projects, I'm going to talk about our programs, and then as I talk, please feel free to ask questions as I go, and then I'm going to leave plenty of time for questions at the end. So, okay, so Philly, 1984. So quickly, my background was I went to Stanford. I was a double major fine art and political science. I was an artist who thought about law school. I had the good fortune of moving to LA. I saw these extraordinary murals down there. I became really inspired and thought maybe I could do a mural. Um, so I applied to the LA mural program. They told me I was past the deadline. I, I you know, my application, I should come back in a year. I just drove them crazy. I'm a total pest. And so that's how we've made it through four mayors. I just beat them down. <laughs> I just wear people out. Um, anyway, so um, eventually I got this commission doing a mural in, in Santa Monica. And it was like so extraordinary because like I'm someone who thought, oh, murals are important because they make art accessible to everyone. Like I believed it then, I believe it now. But standing on this corner at Ocean Park in Maine painting my first mural, it was thrilling. And I was talking to people about neighborhood issues and politics, and it was so exciting. And then I started working with kids on probation, and then I became really sick. I have lupus, and I grew up in Margate, New Jersey, so I came back east to be with my family. And as I started to get better, I thought, oh, I don't want to move back to L.A. I want to stay in this area. And I thought, well, maybe I'll go to law school, because that's what it's, you know, it seemed like, okay, so now I'll go to law school. But then one day I read in the Philadelphia Inquirer about this program called the Anti-Graffiti Network. And our former mayor, Wilson Good, was very exciting. He's the first African-American mayor. And he said, I'm gonna start this anti-graffiti network in response to the graffiti crisis in Philadelphia. And it comes to my attention that a lot of the young people really love art, and I'm gonna have an art component. I was like, oh, that could be me. <laughs> So I sent my resume to the mayor's office, and I thought, okay, I'll call every day if I have to. And then, what, but I didn't have to, because I got a call from the man who was the head of arts and culture. And so I was like, oh my God, I can't believe it. So I called this guy back, and he says, come up to Philadelphia for an interview. I know your work in Los Angeles. I was like, yikes. So I go to Philly, I'm so excited. I meet Oliver Franklin. He sends me to Tim Spencer. 
And Tim Spencer is, he's the guy in the suit jacket, but not the guy at the podium. He is the new executive director of, of the Anti-Graffiti Network. So I go meet Tim, and Tim looks at my resume, and it's like a five-minute conversation. And he goes, okay, you're hired. You're going to have about 1,000 kids. They're all graffiti writers. Like, good luck. Essentially, that was it. That was, like, so short. So he goes, oh, wait a minute. One more thing. He goes under his desk, and he gives me a box. And in the box, there are magic markers and paper. And I was like, oh, my God, is this it? And it was like I walked out in the main office, which was about the size of this space, and there were community organizers, because there were like 12 community organizers at Anti-Graffiti, and it was like chaos, because there were police officers and judges calling and detectives and all these kids, like a million kids with backpacks that made clicking sounds. And people would say, what's in your backpack? And they would say, books. And you, you, then they'd go in the hall, and they'd be here, and I'd be, oh my god, they're like writing on the walls of City Hall Annex. This is awful. But like I'm someone who's oh, who always like reading crime novels, right? So I'm like I'm living on the edge. <laughs> I thought, well, I'll try this for a few months and then I'll go to law school. <laughs> that is my out. So um, I was like, oh my, what do I do? So I'm here. I am. I'm hired. I was hired at twelve thousand dollars a year. My title was field representative because they didn't know what to do with an artist. I didn't have a desk, so I was on the move. <laughs> And the city gave me an old undercover police car that was totally dented, and when you beeped the horn, the trunk flew open. It was very mysterious, but it was like my lemon. I loved it. And um, I drove around Philly and saw these like graffiti pieces. I saw tags, but then I saw some really interesting graffiti pieces, and I thought, well, Wilson Good was right. Some of these kids have talent. So I want to pause here about anti-graffiti for a minute. So there are a couple points I want to make. Number one, um, Wilson Good had a lot of courage because he was taking on what was really a social epidemic. And he put money on the table to intervene in what was clearly a citywide crisis. Elected officials can talk all they want about problems. If they're not going to make a commitment and put funding on the table, it becomes a moot point. And he was brave and he stood up to people who said, what a waste of taxpayers' money. Why don't you just send graffiti writers to jail? Well, that wasn't very practical. And why don't you just paint it out? Well, cities all over America were painting it out. And guess what? The graffiti was coming back the next day. So that wasn't really working either. So he was committed to thinking out of the box and said, I'm going to work with the kids who are writing on walls. And we're going to develop our programs. And we're going to get them to help us clean up Philadelphia. And it was a visionary program. And I don't use that word lightly. I say visionary because the seat of power was open to kids from the poorest neighborhoods of the city, period. So this was about access. And to me, that was thrilling and exciting. I had no idea what I was doing. There was no roadmap or blueprint. This was a new program. So I thought to myself, so what am I going to do? Well, there was a system in place. You see how happy everybody looks here? They're all signing a pledge where they swear they will never write on walls for the rest of their lives. They're all going like this. And so and in exchange, they had to do scrub time, and then they were sent to me. So I very quickly had to figure out what to do, what to do, what to do. So I said, okay, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to start run, uh, offering programs. I called up the recreation department and said, I want to offer classes for former graffiti writers. I emphasize former. I called the Philadelphia Museum of Art. And then my boss gave me an assistant, this young man who wrote Tran everywhere. He was notorious. I'm like, really? He's like my assistant? I thought my assistant would come from, I don't know, Penn or <laughs> University of the Arts or a school like that. <laughs> so I'm like, yikes, this guy is my assistant. OK, great. So then I'm talking to Tran, and I said, look, I want to build a program that will reach kids. I, I, you know, I don't want to do anything punitive, so what should I do? So he said, well, you have to understand why kids write on walls. I said, please, illuminate me. Why? And he goes, well, they're trying to build a reputation. Many of them are frustrated artists. They're highly organized. There are graffiti gangs. They meet at 12th and Cecil B. Moore in an empty building on Saturdays. They plan their routes, their leaders, their followers. It was way more organized than I would have ever imagined. So I said, OK, so I would like to infiltrate and meet the leaders. Because if we could meet the leaders and lure them in through art, <laughs> that was my carrot. Uh, we will get all the followers. And my carrot was actually significant because Wilson Good put money on the table so I could hire kids. Not immediately, they had to pay their dues, but over a period of time, they could work and stay employed for months and ultimately years. So I'm like, okay, we're going to do this. So um, one night on a Friday night, this was not my plan, there was a knock on my door, and I opened the door, and there is Tran, the assistant, with 10 very tall young men. Tran knew where I lived because I used to stop there for art supplies at my house because the city gave me terrible equipment. They gave me beige paint, big brushes. There was no way to do art. 
So I'm like stunned because they introduced themselves to me as Baby Rock and Knife and Cat and Coral. So I'm like, yeah, I don't know if I should call the police or invite them in. So I said, I don't know why I said this. I said, come in, we'll chat and have some tea. I don't know why I said that. I'm sure I was like the most uncool person they ever met. So they come in and they get really excited. They look at my bookshelf that's filled with art books and I start passing out art books. And one young man, he stood up and he said, well, his name was Knife, which made my spine stiffen. And I, he said that he had some questions for me, that he heard I had done murals in LA. He was clearly the spokesperson for the group. So I said, oh, yes, Knife. <laughs> and it was Mr. Knife, right? So I said, what's on your mind? So he said, well, I want to know what you think about the color fields of Mark Rothko's paintings. And I love William de Kooning and, my, and Hans Hoffman. And my all-time favorite is Andy Warhol. Now, now, these guys all told me they dropped out of school in 11th grade, which was true. So I was curious, I said, how in the world do you know about the abstract expressionists? Really, they weren't mentioning like Norman Rockwell, right? This, these were not household names. So Knight goes into his backpack and he pulls out the magazine Art in America. And he goes, well, I've been stealing this since I was 10. So I said, well, that's highly unusual to steal Art in America. <laughs> I never would have put that, I never would have guessed. So, and, I, and I, I said, but that's interesting. And they were all oh, we love Mark Rothko. I said, that's great, you like Mark Rothko. I said, all of you, please open up your black books. And I saw in those books amazing drawings. They were self-taught. They've been drawing from comic books since they were young. So I thought to myself, wow, now, like, I'm somebody who's had great privilege in my life. Like, I had, like, a mom who was a wonderful artist, a dad who was a businessman who loved art. I went to museums when I was young. I went to Stanford. I went to grad school. It was never mysterious for me to study art. But for these kids who dropped out of high school, or even if they'd stayed in high school, art was something that was elusive. Yet, they had raw talent and they had knowledge. And I realized this is our common ground. We are so different, and yet we have a mutual love of art. And I thought, think about it, Jane Golden. Think about it. They, like, they don't mind heights, they work in the weather, and they're great wall hunters. They could be fantastic mural painters. So I, thought, I went upstairs, I brought down books of murals in LA, Chicago, and San Francisco. I said, look through these books, because this is what we're going to do in Philly. We're going to build a mural program, and guess what? You guys are going to work with me. And they were like, no way. We want to work with spray paint. And I said, well, guess what? You can't at the Anti-Graffiti Network. So they said, well, then we, we're not going to sign up. I said, well, then what are you going to do? Where are you going to be when you're 25? And they said, well, we're going to be famous. We're going to be like Keith Haring. I said, really? I said, so here's a wake-up call. Only a handful of artists will make it in America who can rely solely on their art. So I'm going to ask the question again. Your high school dropouts, where are you going to be when you're 25? And they said, well, quite honestly, we think we'll be dead or a greater from prison. So I said, so now we're making some progress, and you're being honest in why you should sign the pledge and come and be part of this program. I said, because guess what? You like Mark Rothko? We'll go to the Museum of Modern Art. I said, you like art? We're going to go to the Philadelphia Museum of Art, and you are going to paint murals. You're going to help me, and you're going to do something artists all over America would love to do. You're going to get paid to paint after a period of time. And you can make a difference in the civic life of the city of Philadelphia. You guys can do that. You don't have to be outlaws forever, right? And so they were like, mm, well, maybe we'll, maybe we'll sign up. I said, that's great. You should. So um, they left. We shook hands. And on my way to work the next day, I'm like, yes, this is a victory. I see these new graffiti tags. <laughs> Except there's one addition. They wrote Cool Jane up and down Broad Street. So I'm like, OK, this is totally not funny, and I'm going to lose my job. <laughs> and I've never thought of myself as cool anyway. <laughs> so I get to City Hall, and I see Tran, the assistant. And I said, Tran, this is just so bad. He goes, well, you're like the first adult who ever talked to them. I said, yeah, well, here's lesson one. They should have just said thanks. <laughs> this is really unnecessary. So we had an emergency session. We clean, I got them all together. We cleaned South Broad Street. The next week, we had a class at the art museum, and we started going into high gear. And I said, we are going to build up a mural program in the city of Philadelphia, and you guys are going to help. And they did. And you know what? We drove around Philadelphia, and we asked people if they wanted art. And you know what people said in the early days? We're not interested in art. We're interested in housing and we're interested in jobs. This is a poor neighborhood. What can art do? And we would say, well, what would you like here? And people would pause and say, well, wait a minute. No one ever asks us what we want. Things are either not done or they're done to us. And the only visual stimulation we have are billboards advertising alcohol and tobacco. And Miss Rachel Bagby, who was the first block captain I worked with, she looked at me and she said, you know what? Our kids are not going to have beauty because no one is going to the Philadelphia Museum of Art and we're not going around Kelly Drive to see the sculptures. Art is something, it's like foreign. But I said, so what do you want? 
And she said, okay, I'm hearing you. What we want is that we went to Africa. We went to Mount Kilimanjaro. And it was so inspiring. We wanted a 20th and diamond on that wall. So we were like, check, done. And so we did Mount Kilimanjaro. And then people looked at the lot and they said, wait a minute, this is disgraceful. We don't really, we, 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 won't, we don't have to take this. And we were like, you're right, you don't have to take it. So we brought in Philadelphia Green and we started organizing cleanups. And then we designed a resource guide to demystify city services. Why shouldn't people in struggling neighborhoods have change? Of course they should. And so we found ourselves in the strange position of being on the front lines of social change. Like if you had met me in 84 and said, Jane, what do you think murals can do? I'd say they can beautify, they can inspire, but I wouldn't have said they're change agents, right? But that's what I saw with my own eyes. I saw the murals become a beacon and a focal point and a sign that people cared and more importantly, that things could change. And when that started to happen, I realized, wait a minute, we are seeing some success here. This is not when we become complacent and go, yay us, right? No one's writing on the wall. Isn't that great? Kids are working on it. No, there's got to be a greater strategy at work here to try to use the art to do other things in the neighborhood. The art should be a broker for other things. So we saw people go from being on the sidelines feeling disempowered, disenfranchised, like I'm tired of moving the rock up the mountain and nothing happening in this community. Suddenly people said, wait a minute. We're engaged and we're seeing something happen, something move. And that was power. And so we were able to grab onto it and we started doing murals in other places and working like this with a famous artist, Kent Twitchell, who was from Los Angeles. Now, Kent is someone who was, at this time, 1989, was one of the top five muralists in the country. He was getting $50,000 a mural in Los Angeles. We had a $2,000 grant from the Arts Council. So I called him up, I said, well, we'd like you to come to Philly. Bad news, I have $2,000. He said, well, I'll come to Philly if I could do Dr. J in a suit. I'm like, Dr. J in a suit, that's so interesting. Why? He goes, because I want kids to think beyond sports. So we tracked down Dr. J, he was shooting a TV commercial, his agent gave me two minutes. I run in like at the speed of light. I'm like, Dr. J, my name's Jane Golden. I work with kids, I work, he's like, slow down. <laughs> he said, whatever you're asking, it's yes. <laughs> I think he just wanted to get you know, the TV commercial going. But anyway, so he was like, he was great and he posed and he met all the kids and the figure is actually on a parachute cloth embedded in the wall with acrylic gel and the shadow and the background are painted directly on the wall. But the way Kent Twitchell worked was in a very digitized way that we would use computers with. But of course, then this is like before computers. So we did this all with photography. But what I love about this site and why I pause here is because this was an eyesore. There was trash five feet high. There was graffiti everywhere. And people said when we started working here, you know what, that site's going to get graffiti. That's a mess. It's never going to change. And you know what, people tell me that. It's not going to happen. Naysayers, cynics, critics, I'm like, I go like that. Because you know what, if you don't take a risk, then what is it, right? What, what is life then? I mean, for me, the people I respect most in life, the people who actually move things forward, who are change agents, You've got to take a risk. And if you fail, you fail, but fail forward. Fail in a smart way. And I just felt like we're moving. We are doing this. And then we did it, and no one touched it. 1989, no one ever has graffitied this. Isn't that wonderful? 3,600 murals, indoor and outdoor murals, maybe 12 have been defaced. So this makes my heart sing when I go by here and I see the lot is green and the mural looks so beautiful. And then we work with Sydney Goodman. I am large, I contain multitudes, a quote by Walt Whitman. So then it's, okay, so then the 90s come and we work with tons of kids, tons of, since 84 we've worked with 40,000 young people. So if those anti-graffiti years were really good, but we were basically a cleanup program with an art component. So in 1996, my former boss passes away, I think, okay, now I'm going to, anti-graffiti will be restructured, I'm going to go to law school. So my brother, thankfully, he's a lawyer, he says, don't go to law school, you should run an art program for the city. So I said, if there was one, he said, we'll start one. So he said, why should that stop you? So I said, oh, huh, I guess I could see Ed Rendell. So we go see Ed Rendell and we ask Ed Rendell if he would reconsider saving the art program. And we knew we wanted to work with Mike DiBerardinas, who was the recreation commissioner, who's now a deputy mayor, who's a very visionary person, because we had talked to Mike about moving there. So we said, we want to move, we want to move to recreation, we want to work for Mike DiBerardinas. So Ed Rendell thought about it, he called us back in, he said, that's going to happen. Come up with a name for yourselves. We said the Mural Arts Program. Now it's 1997. He goes, Jane Golden, you're in charge. But I wasn't in charge of much because we had a very tiny budget. <laughs> 
So um, we formed a board, got our own 501c3, flew into action, started raising private money, matching private money with public dollars. And then we started to really, we, we realized, okay, we're a pro art program. We're gonna open our doors to all kids, not just graffiti writers. We're gonna work with emerging and established artists. And we're gonna do high risk projects like this one in Grace Ferry where we were able to work with blacks and whites and all communication had shut down. There had been a murder and beatings. And it was just people said, nothing can change, nothing. And we said to people, show people the world, the, show the whole world that change is possible in Grace Ferry. And after we did this mural, the dedication was the most integrated event down there. And we've done 10 major projects since then. And my second job is I teach at Penn. And I love it when community leaders come talk to my students, because I really want them to understand that change doesn't necessarily happen top down. It could be bottom up. And I love the fact that the community is not talking about race. That's not to say racism is gone, but they're talking about economic development. So some of the changes happen when we're there, some changes happen when we're long gone. And I'm not saying that what we do sort of cures everything in an urban environment, but I am saying that murals show us the catalytic role that art can play in the life of the city, and we have seen that firsthand. And then, of course, this mural came along that showed people that the work can be the same quality as work you find in galleries and museums. This is by Meg Saligman. It's just so beautiful, really glorious. And then we started doing gateway projects. And if you look at the murals that we've done around the city, the murals, the mosaics, the ceramic, the stained glass, it's really reflective of what people want, their stories, their hopes, their dreams, their triumphs, their struggles. But it's really like the autobiography of the city of Philadelphia. And that, to me, is so wonderful because there are so many people everywhere who, it's like life is so overwhelming. There are all these messages and ads in the media, buy this, do this, that there's no room for the intimate stories of survival in, in Philadelphia. And the murals sort of found their way into people's lives in a very deep, wonderful way. And I, I love the fact that on walls throughout our city, whether it's the far northeast or northwest or southwest, that there are these wonderful stories of people's lives. That's Herman Rice, who was a community leader. Uh, he had been in a gang, and he left the gang. He went to Penn. He became a social worker. And he was devoted to, sh to closing down drug houses in Mantua and getting people into treatment. Or a project like this in 2004, when we decided it wasn't, it was no longer enough to just do a wall. We were interested in the block and the, the, the lot and the whole community. And so we started working with Penn, uh, Philadelphia Green and the Urban Tree Connection and really reclaiming space. And that's Miss um, Jones, and she was like the matriarch of the neighborhood. And then we started working in pocket parks like this one. This is by David Gwynn. Or here, now, more recently, we've started working with a whole cadre of younger artists. And every year we employ 200 artists, that's 200 muralists, assistant muralists, and teaching artists every year. So when we talk about the history of muralism from the 1930s to today, you think about the 1930s when the federal government had money and they were really supporting the arts in this country. I think in Philadelphia, it's extraordinary that artists can get this level of support. So you have a ton of young artists graduating from art school and instead of moving away, decide to work with the mural arts program. Our artists are specifically moving to Philadelphia to join forces with us. And we also have a great um, restoration program. This is a Keith Haring mural, very, very famous. He was here in 1989, and we received a large grant from the Keith Haring Foundation to restore it, and we worked with conservators and curators to do this, and it was a great dedication. We have an art education program. I think it's one of the city's best kept secrets where we have about 1,800 young people in our program. We do high impact residencies. We have a foundation program. We have emerging muralists and then an internship, apprenticeship, and an entrepreneurial program. We like the fact that kids can stay with us for five, six, seven years. What I learned at Anti Graffiti is that if we want to make a difference in a young person's life, especially a young person who's fallen through the cracks, a four week program is not going to cut it. It's sustained substantive programming. It's sustained programming over a long period of time. So kids stay with us till they're ready to navigate their next step in life. We take kids to look at colleges and trade schools, art school, community college. We do portfolio development with them. And then for kids who graduate from high school, and 100% of our kids actually are graduating from high school, some of them feel nervous and not ready to make that next move, we hire them and get them ready for their next move. And then we wrapped a fleet of recycling trucks. We love this project. So our kids studied uh, Photoshop, looked at Philadelphia at the turn of the century when there were fa uh, factories here making fabric with environmental themes. They made the designs and we wrapped the trucks. Then our kids worked with animators and designed a series of litter-eating animals 
that are wrapping our big belly trash cans that have been defaced, except when they're wrapped, they're not. There we go. And then we did a project called Home Sweet Home, which is about the impact of homelessness on our kids, where we did small murals that directed them to come to an empty house that we took over and turned it into an art house. When you walked in the house, our kids created art about the issue of homelessness. You, people went up to the third floor where we had a resource room about bills moving through Congress. We partnered with Elizabeth Perez Luna from WHYY, so she did an audio mural, so you heard the kids' voices. So it was art as advocacy and activism. So an example of the art in one of the rooms. And then we're partnering with Goldman Properties to bring well-known artists to Philadelphia, to Center City, to create a collection downtown of street artists' work. And, this, and we're also partnering um, these artists with our art ed program. So we're, we're really offering kids a world-class experience in the arts. This is Kenny Scharf. I know it's sort of strange. I, some people think it's fun. He's really famous. And the fact is he was great with our kids and super inspiring. This is Miss Rockaway Armada. It's an artist collective. I love the title of this, How to Turn Anything into Something Else, all about transformation. And then this is by a team from Berlin who live in Brooklyn. And this is Freddie Sam, who's from South Africa. And this was painted half in Juarez, Mexico, and half in Philadelphia. And it's all about the impact of deportation and immigration on families. And this is Peace is a Haiku Song. It's a tribute to Sonia Sanchez. She wanted her legacy. She wants her legacy to be about peace. She brought in her friends, um, Toni Morrison, Maya Angelou, Alice Walker. They all have haiku on this wall. We also created a beautiful book, because we often do companion books with our projects. And there were mini murals throughout the city. So we had, also we had haiku workshops, the mini murals. So you went to the workshop, you followed the mini murals to the big project. And then we gave everybody a book throughout the city. And Sonia is talking about this project wherever she goes across the country. And then this is a tribute to The Roots. And we're really, this was really thrilling because you know The Roots are now the band for The Tonight Show. And they're just really a model of kids who went to Kappa, who loved art, and made it big, and they were great with the kids in our after-school program. And then we also built recently a Viking ship. This is Dennis McNett, who's quite well known. It floats, <laughs> in case you wondered. <laughs> and then our behavioral health project. This is where we're using art to overcome the stigma of homelessness, mental health issues, and addiction. We're using it to heal individuals, connecting people back to their community, and we're being evaluated by the Yale Medical School. We will have data in six months. There'll be no, there's nothing like quite like this around the country. So the data we have is uh, it's the result of a four-year intensive study with a control group, and we will have information that speaks to the impact both on individuals and communities. And this project was the start of it. It's a methadone clinic. I wish I had a before shot. It was gray. It was peeling. We took over the basement. We turned it into an artist studio. We started working with people in recovery intensively. And people said to us, you know what? People are staying with their recovery longer. And when I would make a site visit, people would follow me to my car and say, I no longer feel like an addict. I feel like an artist. And that is exactly where we wanted to begin. So we started offering more programs. And then we got a major grant from the Robert Wood Johnson um, Foundation. And we've embedded ourselves at provider agencies around the city using art in a very intensive therapeutic way. The mental health commissioner in Philadelphia, who I think is a visionary he's from Yale, he says that he sees us as an alternative therapeutic model, and he said it's about time we start thinking out of that box. He said we have a black box way of thinking. We send people into communities from the city and say, hi, I'm from the city. I'm here to help you. And people go, eh, because they receive no services or bad services. People become part of a public art project. They feel safer, and they're more inclined to get services, and now we're going to have data to back that up. And here, this was created by homeless women and their children, and they wrote a community poem. Then we work with um, a refugee populations. This is about trauma and resilience and acclimating to a new country. Now the way we work, another model of our practice is we take over empty storefronts, we turn them into hubs. Here we offer everything from ESL to social services to painting, sewing, cooking, dance, weaving, mural making, and printmaking. And it's at 7th and Dudley. And we're working with the Nepali, the Bhutanese, and Burmese community. And we also work with returning vets. Here we also partnered with a great writing program, Warrior Writers, and created another book. This is called Communion Between a Rock and a Hard Place. When vets come back from Iraq and Afghanistan, they say they don't know where they are anymore. They feel they can't. Are they in America? Are they here? So one side is actually Clark Park, and the other side is Iraq. And, but if you read this book, it was so moving. And many of these young vets, they felt like they just wanted to disappear until they started to create. 
Here's Rise and Shine, created by a thousand people in recovery. The beacon on Broad Street, you can see it from the train. This is, and then we have a restorative justice program where we work in four prisons, including Greaterford State Prison, and we have a new reentry program as of four years ago. And we're training people in landscaping, building skills, mural making, design, and technology. We also have a program where we work with crime victims and prisoners at Greaterford Prison. This is Healing Walls, a very difficult but rewarding project. This is uh, uh, created at St. Gabriel's Hall and the community. This is about the impact of prison on families and their QR codes in this. Everything we did, we structured around providing people services and some hope. So everything, from every visioning session to every paint day, we had providers there and people who need the services. Restorative justice, um, we're, busy, we're busy, and the Guild program we're really proud of. We have a 9% recidivism rate, 9%. The national average is about 66. So people who say, what, does, what can art do? we can move that needle. Look at us, and now what we're doing is we're reclaiming these spaces all over the city. There are community and recreation centers in Philadelphia that will never be fixed. There will never be the money to fix them up, but we are transforming individuals, training them, giving them skills, and then challenging them to go out in the community and make a difference in the life of the community, and it is a complete win-win. Total transformation, this is a community garden. This is about, then we have another division, public art and civic engagement. This project is about the impact of work on people's lives. It's metal, it's ceramic, and it's paint. We paired a design team with muralist Eric Oakday. This is Stephen Powers, 50-second story walls that you can only see from the L train. Stephen Powers was a graffiti writer. I met him when he was 16. He is now a famous artist. You probably can't get a canvas from him for under $50,000. He travels the world. He is so wonderful, and I am so proud of him. And when we first went and did, we got a big grant from Pew for this. And we opened up a sign shop. There was a docudrama. There's a wonderful book. And it was, nobody wanted to talk about love. Everybody was mad at the city. And eventually people started talking about history and memory and love. And these tours, we have tours every Saturday morning. We have mural tours in general, but then we have a love letter tour every Saturday and it sells out. Here we worked with a team from MIT. Um, this is called Light Drift. You could change the color of the orb from the shore. Again, muralism in the 21st century. We're working in all different ways. It's really exciting. This is about the dancer and all of us. The lead artist who's a photographer said everyone is photogenic. And then this is about global climate change. We have a restored spaces program where we pair architects, urban planners, ceramic artists, and artists to transform schools that look like prisons. And we build an outdoor interactive uh, learning area that won a prize in the Venice Biennale for architecture. This is Philly painting. We wrapped 61 buildings in color with artists who are from Holland who've been working in the favelas of Rio. The Commerce Department could not get in the door and, when the, and the art led the way. And here we have a big sculpture we did at the Navy Yard with Virgil Marti. And then we worked with famous artists from Paris who do community dinners throughout Europe. Um, and they came, we got a grant to bring them to Philadelphia. They did lots of programs at farmers markets all over the city. And then a giant dinner for a thousand people in front of City Hall. We just finished, uh, we had a huge retrospective at the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Art called Beyond the Paint. And now just a little taste of what's coming up. We're working with Katerina Grossa, hugely famous artist from Berlin. And she's going to be doing this great project, five miles of color along the train line. It'll be extraordinarily poetic. I've worked for four mayors. Everyone talks about the Amtrak corridor. No one has been able to do something about it. We're going to do something about it. It's a temporary public art project. And not only will there be, there be this brilliant color like that, there'll be an audio component with three tracks. Track one, the artist talking about her work as if you're in a museum. Track two, an intense discussion about the industrial corridor, the past, and challenging people to think about the present. And then we're commissioning a composer who is creating an original composition. And then it's our 30th anniversary. So in the end, our work is about impacting individuals, communities, and by extension, there's a huge impact on the civic life of the city of Philadelphia as we turn it into an outdoor museum. But it's not just art for art's sake. It's about art for social change's sake, right? And there's this saying that I love, and that saying is, hope is believing in spite of the evidence and watching the evidence change. Watching the evidence change in young people, in the shelter system, in the prison system, in reentry, in communities, in neighborhoods, with the public art we do, we see things change. And that is really the privilege and the wonder of the work we do. And we believe at the end of the day that art can ignite change and transformation. So thank you very much.